Friday, August 28th, 2020, marked the day when everything changed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On that day, a pig named Gertrude hid in her pen. Um... Too shy to show off her shiny new brain implant. Until she wasn't. All right. Here we go. Great. Gertrude's brain augmentation is called a neural link. It's the size of a large coin and replaces a piece of her skull. It was installed by an advanced surgical robot. The implant consists of many tiny wires placed with micron precision next to neurons so as to read and write information directly from her brain. The weirdest part is that it seems to work. In a proof of concept, Gertrude took a stroll while the implant predicted the position of her limbs based on signals in her brain. It was accurate. It also made blooping noises based on neurons firing. Um. Some call it the Antichrist, a dystopian nightmare, or a promising cure for brain and spine disorders. Brain implants are the beginning of the end. If they become the norm, then powerful institutions get to beam propaganda inescapably into your thoughts. You all sound like Victorians panicking about trains going in tunnels. It's a sin. It's a miracle. It's the machines marching deeper and deeper into our psyche. What's the worst that can happen? Or better yet, What's the best that can happen? Let's talk about that. Hey, Cyborg Grant here. Ha, ah, there's nothing like reading 10,000 books in the park on a sunny afternoon. I've got books in all kinds of languages because, well, I speak every language. Muy impresionante. Incredible. Which means I've analyzed the world from all linguistic perspectives. I also know everything ever uploaded to the internet. My IQ is 10,000. Einstein's was 160. He wasn't that smart. I can solve 10 variable mathematical equations like you do simple arithmetic. It's not like a huge deal. Maybe I seem a little pretentious being a cyborg, but that's just because I'm better than you. It's not my fault. I am from the future after all. I, I've got to step up on you. I'm from the year 3500, which is pretty rad. The year itself is all right, but you know, the idea of it, pretty cool. And hey, maybe you don't think all this is gonna even be possible in 1500 years, but uh, I'm just here to tell you, it totally is. And uh, why, why don't we start talking about the present day, huh? But in 2018, Elon Musk somewhat famously pointed out that humans already are cyborgs because of smartphones. Having one in your hand makes you infinitely more knowledgeable and capable of navigating or translating language or whatever. The problem is, information is exchanged slowly between people and their smartphones. Don't worry though, Elon's got a solution for that. All right, welcome to the Neuralink product demo. I think it's gonna... Mind. Information will be directly downloaded to and uploaded from your nervous system. Electrical signals from the implant could counteract the effects of Parkinson's, epilepsy, paralysis, and many etc. In fact, a brain implant already exists to negate the effects of Parkinson's. Though it works well, the surgery required to install it is incredibly invasive. Why not make it better and more robust? That's essentially the goal of Neuralink. Once this technology can treat or cure nervous system disorders, it would progress towards more of a symbiosis with humans. That's the plan anyway. Bluetooth for your brain. Musk has pointed out that this will take some time. It, it won't be immediate. FDA approval takes time. Not to mention, there are a lot of hurdles integrating biology and electronics. To make things clear, there are two layers to your nervous system, your limbic system and your cortex. Your limbic system is where your emotions come from, and your cortex is your intellect. Optimist Elon, in the long run, wants to add a third layer on top of that. It would be a sort of intellect 2.0. In my last story you never knew about fairies, I ironically had a lot to say about the intellect. It's created the most impressive inventions of civilization, and though I was pretty critical of it last time, I did briefly acknowledge some of the good things that it's created, like uh, vaccines and air conditioning. Now, we're talking about cyborgs. Essentially, the opposite of fairies. Half human, half machine. People robots. Will we one day merge with machines to become a new kind of being that's levels of magnitude more intelligent than us? Duh. 
Already, vending machine software company 3 Square Market has implanted microchips into 92 of their 196 employees, and that was back in 2018. The chipped folk can open doors and buy snacks from vending machines. Weirdly mundane, but kinda freaky. It's a bit of a yikes, a philosophical quandary, if you will. What if, in the future, you could have a chip with your identification, medical history, and also it monitored your vital signs and alerted a doctor or even corrected the issue automatically if something was wrong. Realistically, however, this technology is a little ways off, but do you see what I'm getting at here? There's enough benefits to these implants that they could work their way towards normal fairly easily, even if they may seem a, a little invasive. The option is coming. It's just a matter of whether or not it remains an option, and whether or not those who don't have an implant will become obsolete. With that in mind, let me ask you a question. What's the point of a human when intelligence can be digitized and made to command reality a hundred million times faster than you? Yeah, in case you're wondering, this eye is cybernetic. With this thing, I can see sound waves, infrared. I can zoom in super far, uh, microscopically and macroscopically. You're gonna love the future, let me tell you. Also, my cells don't age. Uh, I'm over a thousand years old. I, I think I still look pretty good. <laughs> But uh, just full disclaimer, ever since I got this third layer of my nervous system, I felt a little crazy. All this knowledge flowing through me is a lot. But, but let me tell you, this implant is all it's cracked up to be. It took me a millisecond to read a book that made me think God wasn't real. Then in another millisecond, I read a book that made me doubt that first book. Then I read another that made me doubt the word God means what we think it means at all. Then I read a thousand more books on the same subject and a variety of ones, including Arbor Day. A day to celebrate and plant trees. And it only took 10 seconds. But none of that matters. My hedonistic downward spiral into knowledge is what matters. It all came in too quickly to know how I felt about any of it, so I became an anxious, empty vessel that analyzed everything. Weeks in dark rooms absorbing lifetimes of information that vividly played out in my digitally augmented mind space. TV shows, books, movies, I absorbed it all. What? Maybe this isn't what you would do with this type of technology, but I, I guess knowing everything promised peace of mind. So I went for it. After watching, listening, and reading everything on the internet, I wanted knowledge and stories bound only in books. The ones on Amazon, then in bookstores, then uh, all the way down the rabbit hole to libraries from fallen civilizations written in languages mostly forgotten. I was going to pull alchemical gold from the graveyard of forgotten idea systems by knowing everything ever written everywhere, but it all became too much to keep straight. <laughs> That's how I dealt with having an artificial intellect anyway. Maybe you'd deal with it differently. I, I can be kind of obsessive. I was gonna blow my mind to then change the world. Sanskrit texts and quantum mechanics. I Sorry to be all new agey. I just, uh, I don't know. This is how it is these days. <laughs> I was going to intertwine far out poetry and crystal clear logic, but it all became too much. <laughs> what good is hyper intelligence when I can't integrate it into my life? But I don't regret knowing everything. Hyper intelligence is the future. Hyper intelligence is the future. So much so that I, I'm gonna shut it off right now. Oh. oh uh. Ah, that's better. It's good to be back in the old, uh, old city. Oh, oh, it's good to be just biological sometimes. Oh, I can get a little worked up when the artificial logic gates start firing. I, I you know how it is, sir. I, I guess you don't. Uh, and, uh, yeah, even though I'm from the deep future, I still have this, uh, Samsung Galaxy 7 that's cracked and, because I drop it all the time, and, uh, it's really slow because I'm too lazy to delete stuff off of it, but... Uh, that's how I do. And yeah, full reminder, I am from the future. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit, huh? I was originally born in the late 20th century. I'm a 90s kid at heart. 
But then, I accidentally got cryogenically frozen and woke up in the year 2400. Immediately, I got an implant, because, well, that's just what you do uh, in the future. Lived for about a thousand years, and then decided uh, the future really wasn't for me. Uh, it was kind of depressing. So, I went back in time to uh, help write a different future. A better one. My life is like Futurama meets Phil of the Future. I would know, because I've seen every TV show ever. <clears throat> anyway, let's not get off topic. It's time for the meat and potatoes. If having a smartphone makes someone a primitive cyborg, then isn't a microchip implanted directly into our body just the next stage of that? Squidward was wrong about the future! 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 It's gonna be sick! If we make it that way. I do want to be clear that brain augmentations are not a one-way ticket to losing your mind. In fact, like computers of the present day, they can really enhance what it means to be human. Most of the time, this thing inside me is really useful. It's just a matter of uh, properly steering ourselves down the technological rabbit hole. Even in the 21st century, society is already built on the foundation of machines, and it already makes people a little crazy. And of course, that doesn't mean the machines aren't worth having around. We just gotta steer a little better. Ahem. <clears throat> Programmed traffic flows with citizens living in gridded cities built with architectural equations. Electronics connect humanity in a global network of data and travel, which is cool. Algorithms are the foundation of our economy. They determine everything that flows from screens and into your mind. In an ideal world, that'd be morally neutral. Information that was once confined to dusty encyclopedias in cobwebby corners of the library are now available to everyone with an internet connection. Now that's cool. However, us millennials spend an average of five and a half hours a day on our phones and even more on other screen-based entertainment. We've been consumed by the digital world and the scrolling that takes us through. It. It's a modern miracle. A beautiful thing, because that's how I play StarCraft and stuff. But beauty has a dark side. How's your job? Do you like it? A Gallup poll says 85% of workers worldwide don't. How's your life? Do you love it? The National Center for Health Statistics says 13% of Americans are on antidepressants and an even higher number can officially call themselves depressed. And 18% of the population suffers from anxiety, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Legal and illegal drug addictions are increasing, and so are overdoses people ending their own lives, too. These numbers have skyrocketed since the year 2000, which is right around when the internet began to truly make itself mainstream. Now, look at this graph of smartphone use. Notice how right after 2012, over 50% of Americans have smartphones. Now, check out this graph of teenagers who have had a major depressive episode in the last year. There's a noticeable increase for both genders, but for girls, it's particularly bad now reaching one in five girls who have been majorly depressed recently. A world you interact with through a screen tends to be image-focused, and clearly, there are consequences. As Tim Dillon, a man whose words haunt my dreams, said, The kids are on, they take all these pills, they're black-eyed nihilists, the kids. They literally believe in nothing, the children. They think nothing matters, and they're right. Also, in 1980, over half of teenagers said they hung out with their friends on a daily basis. Now, it's half that, at 25%. Face-to-face -face interaction just isn't happening much these days. This all gets talked about by Jean Twenge in her book, iGen. Minus the Tim Dillon bit. The effect of technology on people's minds is powerful. So to keep ourselves from losing our minds, it's important to understand one thing. Technology and mental illness are colliding in a hyper-connected world of our design. All this being said, I do want to say that even with this brutal disregard for mental health, uh, machines can be great. Specifically, the internet, which is the product of machines. 
It's proved more and more essential to our way of life with every passing year. It's also leveled the playing field. Anyone can get famous on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok as of now. No longer do councils of suited executives hold the golden key to the airwaves. And, and, for the first time in history, niche communities can connect unaffected by distance. Furry subreddits and My Little Pony cosplay. It's all thriving, man. But it's undeniable that in our newly hyper-connected world, we're disconnecting from what makes us human. Why else would social anxiety be the meme of generations? Social interaction has been a cornerstone of the human experience since time immemorial, and we're forgetting how to do it, inventing about it in memes. How do we keep our humanity amidst our technological revolution? Really, that's the crux of the cyborg conversation. It's why I came back to the past, like a modern day Samurai Jack. <clears throat> We've talked enough about problems. Let's talk solutions. When it comes down to it, the mental stability we've been chipping away at is a problem of consciousness. Consciousness is the one thing machines don't have. Machines don't feel, but they can process information at 100 billion trillion miles a second. It's easy for them, but for us, the information age has been uh, a little traumatic. Also awesome, but mildly is slowly, creepily traumatic. Hours of glowing information dumps on topics that don't matter and ones that strike a nerve and everything in between. Gossip, politics, disease, sports, social justice, conspiracies, riots, disasters, natural and financial. An accelerated pace of conversation and infinite perspectives. We've inadvertently entered a crisis of consciousness because we've become slaves to the things that don't have it. Ha. <laughs> Maybe don't think things are that bad right now, just w we can keep things as is, take our time, and uh, figure this all out. Then we can understand the power and responsibility that comes with godlike information processing. Since computers first entered the average modern home in the 1990s, their potential has evolved so quickly that socially, we've been unable to keep up. What? It's a prank, dude. So let's just put the kibosh on the new technology, take some time to figure things out, and it'll all be good. <laughs> oh, that, that's a good one. Uh, the cat's been out of the bag since Babylon dog. Uh, tr civilization has always favored innovation over tradition, and the faster you innovate, uh, the more successful you wind up being. Even the Dark Ages was just a part of the bigger innovative picture can't stop it. Except, I guess, with the complete collapse of civilization, which some people are talking about right now, but honestly, it's probably not gonna happen. I, I saw the future, man. And sure, it's not set in stone, but we're gonna write a better one. It's gonna be cool. We're, we're gonna make it through. All we gotta watch out for is what I saw, which was uh, a bunch of bleep blooping cyborgs who never wanted to talk or communicate at all about their feelings because it would cause too much chaos in the digital mental collective matrix. It was really sad. I could tell everyone was depressed and anxious on the inside, or at least most of them. No, I don't want to generalize. It sucked. That's why I came back to this time, because the early 21st century is the very beginning of when consciousness starts merging with machines. Any changes we make now will echo across generations. That's how the time-space continuum works. Let's make a better future. And all right, one more potential counter argument to what I'm saying. Uh, maybe you're the kind of person who thinks, well, let's just not merge with machines and uh, that should keep things from getting too crazy. There's a problem with this though. Uh, see, no matter what we do, we're going to have to deal with a unhinged super intelligence. Because even if we don't join the intelligence party, computers are gonna be smarter than us eventually. In some ways, computers already are smarter than us. Oxford computer science professor Nick Bob Ostrom says in his book Super Intelligence that a biological neuron fires at about 200 hertz, or 200 cycles per second, whereas transistors in modern computers operate at a gigahertz, or a billion cycles per second. Also, computers don't need to fit inside a human skull. They can be as big as a warehouse or bigger. Efficiency, rate of computation, and size are all things that limit a human brain compared to a digital one. Therefore, Bostrom argues, computers will always have an upper hand over biology. Computers, man. Billions of electronic switches go on and off, off and on, zero and one, one and zero. Cold logic blinks across circuit boards to build uh, Minecraft, video calls, apps. Facebook, which is now. Computers are ridiculously efficient at specific tasks like chess, information processing in general, and uh, Tetris too, they're really good at that. But there's one thing they don't have. I'll say it again, consciousness. 
Computers, as of now, don't have a mind, but they are intelligent so long as we give them the right software and hardware. After all, intelligence is just the ability to process complex information and act effectively on that information. Computers are a powerful extension of our voice that thinks, the logical part of you, the one that is self-aware and is, uh, statistically speaking, probably ashamed to be naked. It identifies with the name. It's your internal monologue. Your dreams and feelings are something else. Those are what the thinky machines don't have. The computers will never have your intuition. Here's the thing though. It's entirely possible that one day computers will develop a kind of intuition. It just won't work the same way it does in us. By being conscious, we're able to put information together in ways that are truly creative. This is how we learn, understand the world, and innovate. But there's this idea called artificial general intelligence. Bostrom says AGI is the mark for when a machine has the capacity to understand or learn any intellectual task that a human being can. If a computer achieved AGI, it too could learn as well as a human could, whether it was conscious or not. With its digital neurons firing at the speed of light, able to achieve brain sizes as large as a mountain range or, or the shape of a swarm of nanobots. In a poll conducted among top AI specialists, achieving AGI is predicted to take anywhere from 10 years, with most believing it will be closer to 100. Point is, it's been spotted on the horizon. Nobody knows for sure when or even if the threshold could be crossed. However, what's undeniable is that because of the highly efficient nature of transistors, the intellectual limit for a digital mind is thousands of magnitudes higher than a purely biological one. That's why the motto of Neuralink is, If you can't beat them, join them. Why let computers be smarter than us when we can join the intelligence party? It's worth mentioning that Professor Bostrom doesn't think we'll merge with machines because biology is too messy and incompatible with technology, and the fact that a purely artificial mind could theoretically be the size of a planet means it's no use trying to compete anyway. But what if, by some stroke of fate, it was actually easier to integrate artificial information processing with biology than it is to build a pure machine with artificial general intelligence? If you think about it, a cyborg would technically be a form of AGI, a computer with creativity. All we gotta do is figure out how to not lose our minds with it. It's power, really. Too much has made many crazy across history and before, so why shouldn't intellectual power do the same? But power can be wielded with dexterity and strength. No mere unenlightened pleb can wield an artificial intellect. It takes a consciousness crystallized into diamond, a, a clarity of mind, body, and soul, capable of absorbing limitless knowledge and acting on it with wisdom. I believe in the next stage of human beings, the human experience, the machine, non-experience, poetry and logic. When I talked about fairies last time, I was talking about these little gods that were expressions of nature. When we were totally embedded in that, we were much more in touch with uh, our primal instincts, emotions, uh, that side of things, dreams, subjective experience. But now uh, we're talking about cyborgs, expressions of the intellect. Cyborgs are artificial creations with a heaping dose of cold logic. It's no coincidence that the further we progressed along our civilization journey, ultimately it came to this. The further we push along the innovative path of civilization, the more we risk severing our connection with the things that have been with us since before we were human. In the last 2000 years, the intellect has been winning out over nature. What's the limit if that trend is left to continue for as long as civilization holds together? There is no limit. The deep future is going to be weird. So don't don't judge my occasional mania, please. I'm trying to reconcile opposites here. I'm trying to hold access to limitless information and immortality all inside this emotional monkey brain. Oh, it's exhausting. Well, Maybe Nick Bostrom was right, and all this is a stupid idea. Maybe it's not worth doing, and maybe it'll be too hard to do anyway. Bostrom suggests we figure out how to align an AGI machine with our values before we create said digital god. Indeed, a machine with artificial intuition and an artificial nervous system could know things about reality a human could barely grasp. But it would have only emptiness between its circuits. 
It would never have to sleep. It could study itself and improve upon itself indefinitely. And the more it improved itself, the faster it could improve it upon itself. A complicated wind-up toy set in motion by the voice that thinks. It would be a runaway intelligence with no limit. We have real-life examples of high IQ individuals, but there's no telling what something with an IQ of 10,000 would even want or do. For us to comprehend its motives would be like a lizard trying to comprehend a tax return. No offense to lizards, I like them a lot. But as interesting as all this is, I don't feel any closer to answering the question of how we coexist with the logic machines. Even if we do join them, we'll only be delving further into cyberspace, which is already casting a malaise over us. And the alternative of not joining them means an unhinged superintelligence would be unleashed. So the feelings that give our life meaning are poised to either be at the mercy of a digital god, or they're poised to spiral downwards into some depressed, anxious, confused, uh, information overloaded thought loop. This is a hard problem to solve. Uh, hmm. Maybe we gotta zoom out a bit to the biggest, biggest picture, to way beyond the scope of AI. I'm talking about the universe. Have you ever thought about why we're here? Humans, what's our reason for existing? We're the angsty gifted problem child of the animal kingdom. We transcended instinct just enough to build artificial things. As soon as we had the smarts, we built new things, clever things. First, it was stone tools. Then, the cosmos blinked and a sharpened flint gave way to microchips. No longer do eons have to pass to produce profound change. Humanity wields the force of creation. Call it fate, call it coincidence. We've been given a power once held only by the universe itself. It took billions of years for a subatomic soup in the void to intermingle in a way that made it alive. It was only when clumps of stardust identified as human that they molded creation with conscious intention, with thinky thoughts and thumbs. Why are we here? To take things to the next level, of course. Whether you agree with that or not, you're a part of that truth. Civilization has been a journey towards novelty, and unless you're a hermit in the woods, you're at least along for the ride. Modernity began with stone tools and will end with the unimaginable. Since hunter-gatherers first settled down, we've strived for novelty at the expense of everything else. To build cities that hum with symmetry and data, damage was done on the largest of scales, but only because a trade was made. To obey the voice that thinks, we killed a thousand species. Only then could we blink logic across circuit boards to build the realm of limitless information. Was it worth it? Of course it was. We did carve scars into the earth. It was a cold thing to do. It's ruining the world. But look what we gained. On the horizon lies a new kind of thing that thinks faster than any human ever could. I know I seem a little unstable sometimes, but that's only because you caught me on a bad day. My good days, oh my god, like soaring euphoria. And even the days in between the highs and the lows are weird and wild, so uh, this augmentation, uh, all this, definitely worth it. It's just uh, with godlike computational powers comes transcendental consequences for not being able to wield it properly. Controlling emotions is difficult, yeah. Anyway, we were talking about solutions. <laughs> Even though I don't quite have this whole cyborg thing down, I don't have it all figured out, I've learned a thing or two over the last 1500 years. There's an ideal to shoot for, a golden thread made of intense calm and clarity. It's a little abstract. I'm gonna share it with you. What if we didn't just know what we know? What if we understood what we know? I, I guess that's what wisdom is. What if mindless scrolling gave way to transcendental information downloads? Why should the next gods be purely electronic? A mind without experience is no mind at all. Intelligence without wisdom leads to complex consequences. Only love and rationality combined can write a better future. The future is when emotional machines compute with goosebumps. The future is when biodigital minds command reality at 100 million miles a second with passionate revelation. Logic and poetry will intertwine and resonate. That's the story of cyborgs. The story you never knew.